All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to Acts class one. Um, this is, so we, I'd like to go over the uh, syllabus or the class um, outline first uh, before we get into it. Um, anyone taking it for credit? Um, I put a book on here that's going to be required reading. Um, has anyone ever read Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret? Oh, awesome. You guys will be super blessed by it. Um, if you want to take it for credit, it's uh, required reading. There's um, for By the final exam, there'll be like a two-page, double-spaced um, report on it. Um, if you want to, uh, if you're taking it for credit, um, it's an amazing book. Um, I actually have um, an excerpt here. Um, if I, I think I have everybody's email address. Um, I found a PDF version of the book uh, online, so I'll send that out to everybody's email address. Um, if you want to purchase the book, it's like five bucks on Amazon. Uh, incredible book. Um, really, it goes. In, it's written by his son. Um, uh, it says here, uh, Dr. Howard Taylor. Um, he was a missionary to China, started China Inland Missions. Uh, great work um, done by him. Let me just pull up my Google Drive, which I should have had already. Um, so I kind of want to, I just want to read first, as we open up into Acts, like what is the book of Acts? Um, it's a lot, exciting book, a lot going on. Um, and I kind of want to read an excerpt of the Hudson Taylor book. Uh, just a few paragraphs. It says, Hudson Taylor was no recluse. He was a man of affairs, the father of a family, and one who bore large responsibilities. Intensely practical, he lived a life of constant change among all sorts and conditions of men. He was no giant in strength, no atlas to bear the world upon his shoulders, small in stature and far from strong. He had always had to face physical limitations. Next to godly parentage, the chief advantage of his early years was that he had to support himself from the time that he was about 16. He became a hard worker and an efficient medical man. He was able to care for a baby, cook a dinner, keep accounts, and comfort the sick and sorrowing, no less than to originate great enterprises and afford spiritual leadership to thoughtful men and women the wide world over. Above all, he put to the test the promises of God and proved it possible to live a consistent spiritual life on the highest plane. He overcame difficulties such as few men ever have to encounter and left a work which long after his death is still growing in extent and usefulness. Inland China opened up to the gospel largely as an outcome of his life. Tens of thousands of souls went to Christ in previously unreached provinces. 1,200 missionaries depending upon God for the supply of all their needs without promise of salary. A mission which has never made an appeal for financial help yet has never been in debt. That never asked man or woman to join the ranks yet has sent to China recently 200 new workers given an answer to prayer. Such is the challenge that calls us to emulate Hudson Taylor's faith and devotion. What was the secret, we may well ask, of such a life? Hudson Taylor had many secrets, for he was always going on with God, yet they were but one. The simple, profound secret of drawing for every need, temporal or spiritual, upon the fathomless, fathomless wealth of Christ. To find out how he did this and to make our own, his simple, practical attitude towards spiritual things, we would solve our problems and ease our burdens so that we too might become all that God would make us. We want, we need, we may have Hudson Taylor's secret and his success, for we have Hudson Taylor's Bible and his God. Um, I really like that. Um, so it's a really amazing book. Um, it was funny, it was really chilly here a couple minutes ago, now it's really warm. So I'm gonna open that door. <laughs> um, so read the book, um, uh, you'll be greatly blessed by it. I'm looking forward to reading it again. Um, it's a Hudson Taylor spiritual secret. Um, so we're not going to do a midterm exam. Um, we're going to do another paper. I, I like papers because it, um, it really gets us to think about the class, you know, and it, it can be double spaced, two page paper. I just want us to think. So the, uh, one of three different, um, themes that you can write it on, uh, the gospel and missions, which is the book of Acts. Uh, we'll get into that with the writer, um, Luke, why he wrote Acts and what the real focus was. Um, you can write it on the gospel and missions, the empowering role of the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is listed 56 times, it mentions the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Really, really focus on like whose role it was in this book. Um, and you can also talk about the personal call of God. 
you know, the call to Paul, the call to Peter, the call to uh, Barnabas, right? Um, all these men that had these call, the call of God on their life, and we see that in the book of Acts. So, um, so a two-page paper on the Hudson Taylor Spiritual Secret, um, and a two-page uh, midterm, then we'll do a final exam at the end of the course, um, and it won't be anything crazy, it'll just be, it'll be fun. Um, it's good to get into this book, start uh, diving deep um, together. Acts is a fun book to look into, it's a fun book to study. So, the book of Acts, um, we'll start out, uh, we'll open up to Acts 1.1. Um, the first half of this class tonight, I think we're just going to do an introduction. Um, who wrote the book of Acts? Who the book of Acts was written to? Why did he write the book of Acts? Um, a little bit, um, go a little bit deeper into the author. Um, anyone know who the author was? Luke. Luke. Um, Luke was the author of the book of Acts. Um, so we see in Acts 1.1, we um, see the first accounts, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, it's the version that I like to um, to study from, to read from. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a good literal translation. I recommend a good literal translation. Um, New King James, King James, um, New American Standard, I think ESV um, is a good translation. Uh, but I, I use the New American Standard. I like the New American Standard. Um, it's easy for me without the these and thous and the hithers and the thithers and all that. So the first account I composed, O Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So here we have Luke writing to Theophilus, and he's saying, the first account that I composed, and that's the book of, that's the Gospel of Luke. He says the first account, so he wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke to this man Theophilus. So who was Luke? Uh, we have uh, actually not many verses about Luke in the New Testament. We have three, maybe four verses on him. So uh, open up to Colossians chapter four. So the little that we, the little that we have in the New Testament about him, is really immense, and it really uh, paints a picture of this man that uh, is really quite, quite an incredible disciple, um, incredible friend, faithful friend. Um, we see him, and we see him throughout Paul's life, and we see him kind of make appearances, and Paul mentioning him, and it's like, wow, this man, he was something special to Paul. Um, in his in his travel, so in Colossians chapter four, Paul mentions him. In verse fourteen, he says, "Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings, and also Demas." And we see Demas in Second Timothy. Uh, um, Demas was a, also a companion of Paul, but he fell away at the end, um, loving the, the world. Um, we don't really know the circumstances around that, but we know that he left Paul. Uh, but here we have the beloved physician, uh, Timothy, or uh, to, uh, sorry, Luke, uh, the beloved, uh, beloved physician um, here in Colossians chapter 4. And we see in the Gospel of Luke, um, he actually talks about... Um, He's the only gospel writer to record Jesus' statements about physicians. You know, in his gospel, he writes, Physician, heal yourself in Luke 4.23. And he also talks in Luke 5.23. He says, those who are well have no need of physician. Um, and he talks about the woman with the blood, with the issue of blood, um, in, in great detail that only like a really like a doctor, that kind of mindset would go into detail. Um, and that's in uh, Mark or Luke 8.43, also in Mark 5.25 though the woman with the issue of blood. But we see him as a physician, and we see this here, that he was the uh, beloved physician um, here in uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. Uh, Philemon's chapter, Philemon's, Philemon chapter 1 also, we have, um, we have Luke. chapter 1, but there's only one chapter. Um, verse 24, um, it says again, it says, um, as, uh, in verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas again, and Luke, my fellow workers. 
Now we see Luke here. And so we see Luke, and we see it throughout the book of Acts. Um, we see him actually start to use the, the first person in the travels. We see him talk about them throughout like the first um, a little over half. He talks about Peter and Paul as if uh, situations and circumstances happen to them. Like he talks about them. But then in Acts chapter 20, he starts saying we and us. We see this shift in the book of Acts where Luke all of a sudden starts to go on these trips and starts to go with Paul. We see him uh, going on the missionary trips. He was part of the, uh, the shipwreck. Um, and he would have played a great role in that too because he was able to uh, treat people there. Um, and we see like the use of the first person in the book of Acts. But one, uh, one before we go to the last one, like one interesting verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 18. We don't know who Paul is talking about, but most people think he was talking about Luke here. In uh, verse uh, chapter 8, verse 18. Let me know if I'm talking a little fast. I'm told that I talk fast in the You're past. You're talking a little fast. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I will slow down. Thank you. No problem. Um, so here we have uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, in verse 18, it says, We have sent along with him uh, the brother whose fame is in the things of the gospel has spread through all the churches. And a lot of the, the, the scholars and, and the, like the theologians think that he's talking about Luke here. Uh, Luke being um, a, a historian. You know, we see he wasn't present for the gospels. He wrote the gospel of Luke as a historian. Uh, talking to people, gathering information, and the first half of the book of Acts was really information gathering, and he was an excellent writer. They say that the book of Luke in Acts is perfect Greek. Um, I'll, I guess it's the most perfect books that we have in the New Testament when it comes to the Koine Greek language, the, the style of writing. It was really well done. He was meticulous, and he was an excellent historian. Gathered a lot of facts, um, and his gospel, uh, the gospel of Luke, was really well written. And here, uh, some people think that maybe they're talking about the gospel of Luke or as he was writing the gospel of Luke. Um, and But they're saying that we have sent the brother whose fame in the things of the gospel has spread through all the churches. You know, and um, and, and I love that. And we see in the book of Acts, when, when you look at Luke, and he was present in all these things, but he's always talking about Paul. He's always talking about the Holy Spirit or Peter or things going on. He never mentions himself in the book. He says we, but he never says, look, this is what I did. This is what we did. It was always pointing to either the work of uh, the apostle of Paul um, and, and the work of Christ. Um, a very humble man. So the few verses that we see, we don't see a lot, but we see so much. You know what I mean? It's it's really, um, a, a really awesome to see. And then the last one um, is in Second Timothy chapter four, and this is the last book that Paul wrote. Um, and this one's sweet. I and it really like it kind of brings together who this person named Luke was. In verse eleven. Um, you know, and our, uh, we'll start in verse 9. So Paul the Apostle, right? Like the, when we think of Paul, we, we think of Paul. Like, like the, the writer of the New Testament, the Apostle to the Gentiles. The man that was revealed the, the mystery of the gospel in ways that nobody else was revealed to. Like a special guy. And we see him at the end of his life in this little prison cell called the Mamertine Prison. And, and I've, I've been to Rome and I was able to see this. It, it's, it's what they say is the prison. I, I believe them, uh, that it was. Um, and it's a little hole in the ground, really. It's like the basement of this building, um, dirt, just in, like stone walls. And from like, this cold, damp, dungeon kind of thing, um, Paul says in verse 9, says, Make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. You know, like, and it was, like, so Paul is saying, like, and he, and he mentions also here in this book that, like, when I stood up, no, no man stood with me. But he says, Luke is with me. You know, and I really love that, like, the faithfulness of Luke 
that he was, he was there. He was there all the way. And we see him throughout the travels from Europe, throughout Asia Minor, shipwrecked with Paul in the sea. Over and over again, there's Luke. We, we did this. We were shipwrecked. He went to Rome with Paul, and Paul got arrested. That's amazing, right? Like, uh, Paul, who knows what was going to happen to Paul in Rome. He thought, like, he was going and he, he could die. Luke's like, I go with you. You know, like, we're, we're going to go. Um, so this man, Luke, and who he was, and to have that, you know, like to have the, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, um, that it is important for a servant to be counted faithful, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Um, in verse 1, it says, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. Yeah, King James, you know, I mean, we see this man, Luke, um, don't really know much about him. He was a doctor, um, and, uh, but, but he was faithful. He, he, he was faithful to the gospel, really. And this is what the book of Acts is. It's an account of the gospel. Um, that, 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 that's why he, um, he was where, that, that he went through. Uh, so some ancient historians, Eusebius and Jerome, uh, say that Luke was from Antioch, um, that Paul would have met him in Antioch uh, when Paul was there. Um, there are early writings that suggest this, but um, uh, not much. Um, Luke actually mentions Antioch uh, a handful of times in Acts 11, 13, 14, 15, 18, and 11. Um, I'm sorry, I said 11. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 four chapters um, he mentions Antioch so it's almost like he, he has a lot of pride for his hometown um, of Antioch and he actually mentions it in uh, I think it's in chapter 11 right he says that's where they first been, were called Christians right? is that chapter 11 verse 26 um, it says and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul and when he found him he brought him to Antioch and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples there were first called Christians in Antioch. And it's like it's almost like Luke saying, like, yeah, this is my my town. A little little pride there um, that uh, this is where they were first called Christians. Um, Luke is also the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament, um, and he wrote twenty-seven percent of the New Testament. The Book of Luke and the Book of Acts are they're, they're big books. You know, you don't it's. You look through the the John the epistles of John and um, Peter and, and even the Pauline epistles for the most part are, are kind of small books, but Luke wrote a big chunk of writing. There is a debate on the writer of Hebrews um, that maybe Luke wrote it, left his name off of it because he wasn't Jewish, um, but it, it seems like Paul wrote that book. Um, but that's that it, Luke's one of the names that they throw out there when they when they mention uh, when they ask who wrote uh, Hebrews. Hold up. It's the Holy Spirit wrote Hebrews. It's a wonderful book. Um, but it seems like Paul wrote it the way he wrote it, and it looks like a Pauline book. Um, so we mentioned that uh, Luke was a physician. Um, and here he mentions the previous book the, in uh, Acts chapter 1. The previous book is the book of Luke, when he says, um, the first account I composed. So this man... Um, before we get there, uh, he Luke mentioned in this uh, in this uh, book of Acts, he was he had impeccable detail. He was he was an incredible historian. He mentioned ninety five different people from thirty two different countries and fifty four different cities, which is kind of which is incredible. Like the, the the amount of detail that he put into writing the book, it wasn't he he wanted as much information as he possibly could get in there. So again, it's 95 different people from 32 countries and 54 cities and nine Mediterranean islands, he mentioned by name. Um, and it says that he uh, may have gathered the information for the first part of Acts, uh, chapters 1 through 12, uh, from these sources. That he went through and he was talking to people, talking to apostles, talking to disciples, that he was gathering information. And as he was talking, he was like, tell me about Jesus. Like, tell me about um, like all these different events. And he was writing them down and remembering them. And he was very selective in his history. 
in Acts. You know, Acts, they say, is uh, from about 29 AD, 30 AD, to about 61, I read today, um, when, uh, when Paul got thrown in house arrest in Rome. Um, so about 30 years, give or take. And he was very selective at what he wrote about, always focusing on the gospel. Always focusing on how the gospel was being spread throughout, like to the churches, what was going on, and um, he was a man that he, he he loved the gospel, and you can see that in the book of Acts, and even in the book of in the the gospel of Luke, you see him talk about um, you know like the uh, the disciples being sent, and you, you see all these things happening, and he talk like he really talking about the gospel and really focusing on the gospel. Um, and, and what it meant to him. We see that in the book of Acts. One historian has said that he was a lover of the sea, um, Luke. And they, they get that from Acts chapter 27 when it talks about the shipwreck. And it's really neat the way he wrote it because I, I read it again after I read that. Um, and he talks about like being covered by Crete or Cyprus and the winds and the south wind pushing just right. He talks about all these winds happening. And the way he wrote it, it was written as if he was a sailor. I mean, it's really interesting, and he gives great detail about what happened on that boat, the winds that pushed them away, what the, uh, the, the, the mindset of the captain and the, what was going on on that boat. Um, he really gave a lot of detail. If, if it were me, I don't know. There's a lot of wind. The boat's getting sunk. That's all I know. Um, I don't know anything about why the south wind is blowing the direction that it's blowing and why we had to go around Cyprus or whatever. I have no idea. Um, but Luke, it seemed like he... He was actually enjoying himself on that boat. But I mean, we know Paul was, right? So um, so we have Luke. And, and, and I love uh, the character study of Luke, even if there's not a lot of detail about his life. We, we look at him as he, he was a missionary. Yeah, he was a missionary. And we see him throughout the, the book of Acts, going through, going forward with the gospel. His life was the gospel, and that was it. Um, we don't really know too much about him, who he was. All we know is that's that he. One. Introdu- that's one. Introduction. <laughs> um, all we know is that he. Uh, um, oh, sorry. Introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, that he, he loved the gospel and he went forward with it. Um, and um, he wrote this to a man, we think. Um, not really sure who Theophilus was. Um, There's a few different, so what I'll do in some of these, um, I'll give you a bunch of ideas of who it may have been, what people think it is, and then, you know, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a historian or scholar, some of them are really interesting ideas, you know, Um, but that's for um, those guys to argue about, and I just just like to learn about it and to see, um, like, who it could be. So the word Theophilus um, means... Uh, loved by God or a friend by God, Theos Philus, right? Love, uh, phileo is love and Theos is God, like lo- loved by God, this man that is loved by God. And some people have thought that it's um, like uh, not a real person, that he's talking to any Christian um, that he, because we're all loved by God, right? That's, that's what was addressed. But in Luke 1 3, he gives a title uh, or a uh, it looks like a title in Luke 1 when he talks, when he says, Most excellent, Theophilus. In verse 3, um, it says, um, in the end of the verse, that, excuse me, it seemed fitting me for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in con- con- uh, consecutive order, Most excellent, Theophilus. And this title, Most excellent, is, is a title in, in, in the Roman world for like somebody of noble um, blood, like noble heritage. They had an office of some sort. Um, that's why it looks like this guy Theophilus. It was a very common name back then also. It was a very common name in the Roman world. That he, it was an actual person named Theophilus. And they get it from there. They Most excellent Theophilus. Um, and we see this term, most excellent, used by Paul in his defense in Acts 23, uh, verse 26, um, Acts 24, 3, and 26, 25, when he's talking to Felix and Festus um, and making a defense for um, when he's arrested. Um, so we see this most excellent as a title for somebody. Um, so it could have been a Roman official. Some people have said it was even Paul's lawyer, that he was writing to Paul's lawyer. 
uh, after Paul got arrested, he was writing a detailed account of everything that happened to make a defense for Paul in Rome, uh, which is an interesting thought. Right? I find that interesting that he might have written it um, for that reason. Um, and also, there's second century references that he could have just been a he could have been a supporter of the mission work in Antioch, and that uh, Luke was writing him. Uh, giving him a detailed account, and he was a actually uh, an official, uh, uh, somebody in, in noble standing in Antioch. Um, so some interesting thoughts, um, but he's uh, most excellent Theophilus. He's writing this book too, and I like this in Luke one back. It says, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, you know, and that's something that we are called to do um, as, as believers. You know, we're not supposed to take things that um, like face value, right? But to really like carefully study, to carefully study for ourselves, to go into the Word, to get uh, you know, to get our hands dirty with the Bible, and like really study up the Bible, study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed. Um, and we have Luke doing this, and Luke doing it in a kind of a different way, asking people. And um, I, my mind goes to um, uh, Lee Strobel, right? That he kind of had that kind of mentality and um, that uh, and also the man that wrote uh, Josh McDowell also had that kind of thing that he was talking to people and really uh, a critical thinking that um, like really studying to show themselves approved like really studying to say okay, okay like I'm carefully studying I'm not um, uh, I'm not just taking it because that's what my father said you know like but I'm actually studying it for myself because when we stand or when we get to the Bema Seat, we will have to answer, right, in Romans chapter 14, that every man will stand alone before God. Um, and that's uh, when we do, that we know, that we know in whom we have served, it says in 2 Timothy, or um, 2.12. 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy, I don't want to misquote that, I'm sorry. I mean 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.12 For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted in him, unto him until that day. That's to, to know who we believe, to know Christ in a different way. So, and um, I mentioned recently like the, the word know here isn't um, gnosis, where we get our word Gnostic from. Um, it's actually oida, and it's actually to know personally, to know something experientially, not just to know to know, but to know like um, to know who Christ is in a way that I, I know him as my friend, as my God, as my savior. I have a relationship with him. I talk to him. He ministers to me. I worship him. Not that I know of Christ. You know, and we'll see that in the book of Acts with kind of Simon the sorcerer. And we'll see some actually... Um, some pretty rough um, like heresies coming into the church very early on. And uh, one thing that Simon said is like, Simon said, right? Simon says, um, is that uh, um, like uh, he was trying to cast out demons for in uh, Jesus who Paul preaches. He didn't really know. You know like, you know, um, or like when we see this in the, in the book of Acts, we'll, we'll go into it a little deeper. Um, so the book of Acts is really uh, so important for us to have. In, in the Bible, because without it, we would go from John, you know, 21, into Romans. Who is this guy, Paul? Where did he come from? Was he always a Christian? So we have the book of Acts, and it really opens it up to us, like, wow, okay, we can go deeper. We know who Paul was. We know uh, when Peter stood up and stepped up, um, and we see the leadership in Acts, um, in Acts, so... Uh, we'll jump into Acts chapter 1, um, get, get a little bit, and then we'll, we'll finish up one next class. I want to save two for next week, um, because two is like a double, um, there's a lot going on in Acts chapter 2. It's kind of the chapter we want to jump right into. We want to know where the Holy Spirit's uh, coming in, and Peter's preaching a message. Uh, but I think we'll have to wait till next week for that. Um, so in Acts chapter 1, uh, in verse 1 again, it says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day 
when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. All that Jesus began to do and teach. So we have this book, the Acts of the Apostles, right? But um, and, and other people have said it. I'm, I'm not coining it or anything. That maybe it's like better titled Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. You know that we um, see the Holy Spirit mentioned 56 times in this book. Um, and uh, John Chrysostom, an ancient um, a church father said uh, that it's better titled Acts. He said, Acts is the gospel of the Holy Spirit. You know, so you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, John Chrysostom said that it's, uh, the Acts is the gospel of the Holy Spirit. Um, and we see this very early on, um, and we see the power coming in, and, and these guys, man, like, like imagine uh, their, their, their minds, right? That, um, you know, you have... Jesus for three years and you're walking with him and you're learning of him and he's healing the dead and like raising the dead amazing miracles and we see like he is the son of God like uh, Paul Peter said like like where else are we going to go like you have the words of eternal life and then we see Jesus crucified and then everything's um, uh, sad again and then Jesus resurrects and then he ascends and now they're like kind of like okay, what's going on next what's going on and and I don't think any of them could have imagined. I mean, we have the book, we have Acts chapter 2, so we can say, okay, well, yeah, we know the day of Pentecost. We can study that. We know what it represents. Like, what were they thinking when they were staring up into the clouds watching Jesus ascend? Like, did they really understand what was going to happen next and flip the world upside down? So these men that were fishermen and tax collectors and ordinary guys... Um, and in women, we see the women there too. Like, so it's not like a, it's not a sexist thing. It's, uh, there's men and women, and they're praying together. But I don't want to get too far ahead because it's really exciting. Um, and we see uh, this all going on um, in these guys. So we have the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter nine, it says um, in verse fifteen. Um, and this is. Uh, uh, Jesus saying to um, Ananias to go get Paul, he says, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine. You know, that he's a chosen vessel. You know, that we are, that these men did great things. And I, I encourage to, even if you're not taking this class for credit, to read that book from Hudson Taylor, this ordinary guy that wasn't that big, um, going deep into China. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Um, I love to hear that. Guys who aren't that big, you know. Yeah, yeah. And you have Paul who wasn't that big of stature, right? It says um, that we, we have all these things, but that's the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit. And, and I love how, you know, we have leadership skills, I guess. You know, like I work um, in my position at work. I hire people and we go through interview processes and we have to think, all right, is this person leadership potential is this person like do they have what it takes right the the the, the guts to, to get in there and god kind of flips it upside down and says it's my spirit that does it it's not the the biggest and the baddest and the best according to anything that the world has to offer but it's all the holy spirit so it's not like um you know, it's, it's easy to say like to look at a pastor and say, I can never preach like that. Or to look at an evangelist like Billy Graham and say, like, he's just Billy Graham. He's just a little bit different than me or D.L. Moody or, or fill in the blank, really. But to know that it's all the Holy Spirit. It's all Christ. It's not any at all of us. Like, nothing in us at all. And if it is at all anything in us, we're going to mess it up. You know, we will, <laughs> eventually. Pro from, in my case, I, I would probably do it fairly quickly, within the first second, maybe. Um, I would do something. I, I know I would. Um, but that's why, like, the grace of God that leads us and guides us to where it's not works anymore. We're not operating in our flesh. We're not operating to who we were in the world. But God's saying, no, I want to do something different with you. And we see this with the leadership in Jerusalem. When they say, these guys are ordinary guys. Like, why is Peter coming into the temple gates and preaching like this? This is an ordinary guy. 
and it, but they, they flipped the world upside down. And not that they did it, not that they were any great people. And we see Paul stating this, not that I have done anything, right? Like I'm crucified with Christ. I live through him. Um, and this is the book of Acts. So we're going to see some really crazy things start to happen in this book. And I just challenge us not to dismiss it as that was them. Don't try, try not to say, okay, that was, it, it was, a, some things, yes, like, and we'll talk about it with some of the gifts um, and the, uh, the office of the apostle, um, things like that. But when it comes to flipping cities upside down with the gospel, we have that power because we have that God. We have the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. Um, D.L. Moody. Uh, anyone heard of D.L. Moody? D.L. Moody. Um, he was an evangelist uh, in the 19th century. Amazing man of God. I, like, I, I love reading some of his stuff. Uh, he was unlearned. He used to write letters to England, to his friends in England, and some people would get the hold of the letters and they would mock him because of how illiterate he was. Like, he couldn't write. He couldn't finish sentence. Like, he was just really... Um, his, his school age was very, um, he didn't, I can't remember what grade he finished, but it wasn't that much. Um, he won over a million souls to Christ, not without radio, without television. Um, he went over to England once, um, early on, very early in his ministry, and he was talking to a friend, and his friend said, do you know what? The world has yet to see a man whose life is wholly given over to God. And D.L. Moody said, I want to try to be that man. Not in his works, not in like, I want to be that guy, but he just, I just want to give my life to God. I just want, I just want to, um, Romans 12, 1, that I would present my body on the altar. That I would present my body there and let him do whatever he wants with it. And that's all faith is. We're not, uh, when we have our faith heroes in Hebrews chapter 11, um, there was some action, but the action was just surrender. Like, it wasn't really, like, like, uh, the faith is, is God's faith. It's Christ's faith. He produces it in us. So we don't, uh, we don't have to strive for that. So I, I like that story about D.L. Moody because he's, he's one of the guys where I think, wow, oh, I can't be like that. That guy is, I mean, he's, he's amazing. And really, he was just used by Christ. He was used by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to see that in the book of Acts with um, Peter and John and Stephen gets up. And we see this, um, Stephen, and he says he was moved by the Holy Spirit. He got up and he started speaking. Um, and he was a deacon. You know, he wasn't one of the apostles. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a deacon. The, the deacons were uh, you know, Stephen and Philip and a couple of the guys we'll see in Acts chapter 6. But anyway, um, like Acts is Christ-centered. It's all about Christ. It's all about the gospel. Um, and we see this in, in Acts 1.1. All the things that Jesus began to do and teach. And we see Acts at all the things that Jesus continued to do and teach. Um, through the church. Because Christ is the head of the church. Um, so, in Acts chapter 1.1, 1, 1, uh, do and teach is so uh, important. We see this and... There's a lot of, in Christianity, or in, in religion, right, that there's a lot of do this. Um, we're, we're taught things, but the, the, the do is, the, is, is important. Um, I kind of want to clarify. Like, um, in order to disciple somebody into, like, evangelism, we need to evangelize. In order to disciple somebody and teach somebody how to pray, we need to be men and women of prayer. You know, so we have this that Jesus brought these men up, and it was everything that he taught them and did. You know, Jesus, when he made disciples, it was follow me, right, in Matthew 4. Now, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they followed him, and they did. They, they, they followed him as he did it when they uh, when he was went to, old, to the mountain to pray. When, when he, they, they saw it. They saw that he was doing things. And so we also, as we go forward, as we go uh, a little bit deeper in the book of Acts, that we would be people that, if we're teaching, that we're also doing. And it's, it's, it's super important in discipleship. Um, that, and so in Ezra chapter 7, turn to Ezra chapter 7 really quick. See, Ezra was awesome. Ezra was a uh, disciple of Jeremiah. Ezra 
Ezra chapter 7. Verse 10. It says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. So you have Ezra preparing it in his heart that he would uh, seek the word of God and practice it and then teach others to do so also. And it's so important. And we, we will go through Acts and we'll see men of God and women of God being raised up. Um, and we'll like, like look at their disciples, look at Paul and Timothy, that uh, Paul was a man of, uh, of the gospel. And um, we see uh, uh, Peter um, stepping up. And we, we look at these things. We look at the, the, the faith of these men and women, that it was an act of faith. And as we follow people, you know, like and it's being young, I was raised in the church, you know, five or six years old when I came to the church. But I knew that, um, and not in a legalistic way at all, I, I knew that we go out and outreach. I just knew it. Um, and as a young kid, I knew that that is just what we do. And I, I knew it because I saw my father do it. I saw Pastor Moore do it. Um, I saw um, the leadership do it, and it was a church thing. Um, and that I knew that um, I, I that wasn't just told that we should evangelize, that we should do the work of evangel evangelism, um, Second Timothy, right? Or that, you know, Matthew 28, 19, um, to go into all the world and uh, make disciples, Mark 16, 15. We have these verses, but I was told that we do that, and this is how you do that. I mean, like I was, it was, it was more, it was a teach and do. And we see this in the book of Acts. You a lot of doing um, and, and leading people to do it. Um, and in Mark chapter 6, verse 30, it says, The apostles gathered themselves unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught, right? To hear the teaching, do it, and then teach it. You know, it's, 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 it's the to make spiritual children, right? Like it's just like the as the, the cycle goes, to, to hear the word, to hear the preaching, um, to hear uh, the, the, the pastor, to hear the teaching, to hear the, the word of God, and then to do it, and then to teach others also to do it. It's super important. Um, I think we're going to take a break. Um, go to the bathroom. It's about 50 minutes in. Um, and then uh, we'll jump into Acts chapter 1. A uh, fun book, a we'll, uh, fun chapter. We'll see uh, Jesus uh, ascend to heaven. And um, we'll finish up this chapter. Uh, any questions before we break? Yes. How do we know um, Luke wasn't Jewish? Um, how do we know that Luke wasn't Jewish? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I have to look up that. Look that up. Um, but I, I, um, I don't know that question. I think it was his name, um, but I'll have to look it up a little bit more. Okay. So um, I'll get back to it next week on that. Ready? Great. Awesome.